welcome to part two of Yafed's webinar, Uneducated. Uh, today's topic is barriers to self-sufficiency, and my name is Ezra Capel. I am professor of Jewish studies and English and director of the Perlmutter Fellows Program at the College of Charleston. I'm the author of American Talmud, the cultural work of Jewish American fiction, and in partnership with my co-editor, Jessica Lang, we just last month published the book, Off the Derach. Today, I am joined by a distinguished group of panelists, Luzer Twersky, an award-winning actor, Naftali Moster, the founder of YAFED, which stands for Young Advocates for Fair Education, and Yomali Suero, the Economic Empowerment Program uh, Manager at Footsteps. For all of our viewers, please be sure to watch part one of this series, which focused on the vital topic of barriers to higher education. And a recording of both parts of this webinar are available to view online at yafed.org slash events. Um, we will have plenty of time today for a Q&A at the conclusion of our discussion. So if you have any questions for one or more of our panelists, please submit them through the Zoom chat feature. And I want to remind our panelists that to ensure an enjoyable webinar for all of our listeners out there, please mute yourself when you are not speaking. So by way of introduction, uh, each panelist will state their name, their affiliation, and they'll tell us just uh, a little bit about themselves and their background. Let's start with uh, Luzer Torsky. On mute. That's not my name. My name is not on mute. Hi, I'm Luza Tversky, and uh, I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm an actor and a writer. Um, I was raised uh, in the Borough Park. I went to Bells, uh, later lived in Muncie, and uh, that's basically the gist of it as far as the relevance to this. Okay, well, great. Thank you for sharing that, Luzer. Let's turn to Naftali. Great. Um, first of all, thank you, Ezra, for moderating this important panel. Uh, so my name is Naftali Moster, and I am the founder and executive director of YAFED, Young Advocates for Fair Education. Uh, I attended um, Hasidic Yeshivas my entire life, also Bells, actually, like Loser, and we happen to be cousins, uh, some distant cousins. Um, and when I discovered uh, as a young adult um, the long-term handicap the, the lack of secular education has caused me, I had decided to um, form an organization to compel education officials to enforce the existing law, which requires non-public schools in New York State to provide um, an education that is, quote, at least substantially equivalent to public schools, meaning it could be better or it could be the same, but it can't be worse, right? So um, this is kind of like uh, why I formed the organization and um, where I come into this uh, conversation. Great, thank you so much, Naftali, for sharing that. Uh, Yomali. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Yomali Suero. I'm currently the Economic Empowerment Program Manager for Footsteps. But overall, I have been an HR professional for over 12 years, both in recruitment and just doing general career coaching overall. Um, I have my bachelor's from Pace University in uh, Human Resources. And I'm here today kind of to share the, um, I guess you could say the outsider's perspective <laughs> on um, what are some of the barriers that um, folks, especially yeshiva grads are kind of facing at this time in regards to employment. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Um, my first question is uh, for Loser here. Uh, I'd like you to tell us just a little bit about some of your struggles towards uh, financial security and independence that you faced as a result of your limited secular education and perhaps your English language skills. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. I, I forgot to say earlier, and uh, to be honest, I, I just recently rolled out of bed. So I, uh, um, maybe I'm not as sharp as I am at 8 p.m. Um, but uh, um, so I, uh, so when I first left at, you know, when I was 22 years old, I, uh, I, I, was, trying to, I was trying to get a job in the outside world. And, uh, and it's funny because like as, as a lot of people, I mean, Yafed obviously is an education advocacy um, um, organization. And it's, you know, for someone like me, I never 
ended up going to college or getting a GED or doing any of that because I decided to pursue a career in the arts, um, which uh, which y apparently you need uh, you need no education and, uh, and no morals either. Um, but uh, that's so for I, another webinar. Uh, yeah. We'll, we'll... But, uh, but I but the when I bef but even when you're an artist, you know, and you need you need some kind of income like a, a regular job. Um, and I found from the beginning that uh, I was, you know, I, I couldn't get anything. I, I mean, I was in bad, even to this day, you know, if I sometimes get to a point where I need to get a survival job and I'm like, even 12 years later, like, what do I put on my resume? And now I, I do have, I had some uh, professional work. I worked in, in fashion and I've done other things, but even like education, what do you put down? You put down Yeshiva Torres Chesed London, you, sh you know, you put down Belza Talmud Torah. I mean, like, who's going to know what that is and what the, uh, um, and, uh, and, uh, what, what, what skills do you have from having been to those, to those institutions? Um, and, uh, and of course in the beginning, you know, um, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I, I spoke English a little bit better than some of my siblings and some of my classmates, but still I had a heavy accent. Uh, it's not just the language, it's also the cultural, the way you speak it professionally. Um, and, uh, yeah, I couldn't get a job at Starbucks. I couldn't do anything. Um, and this was before the gig economy where now everyone can get work. But for me, the first few years, I was, I was homeless. I was, uh, you know, I was struggling. I was struggling a lot for the first few years uh, until my career took off a little bit. Um, and it's obvious that if I had, you know, some kind of education, some kind of high school uh, um, education, um, I mean, let alone a college education, it would be a lot easier for me. I mean, I don't know, it was 2009, so it wasn't easy, easy for anyone to get a job at the time and uh, probably isn't now. But at the time, people, people if, if you weren't overqualified for a job, you couldn't get any job. Right. Uh, and here you're talking, to, you're talking about a guy who's 22 years old and, and, and basically has never held any like job outside the Hasidic world and has no skills. So uh, I got, you know, I had, I had no shot. I lived in a tent for a long time and, you know, and it was, it was rough. It was rough. And I, you know, again, it's not all the fault of my lack of education. Um, but there's no question that like, uh, uh, that it contributed to it. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that. And, you know, of course, the timeliness of your, your comments right now, we are in another uh, economic uh, downturn, of course, due to COVID and so many difficulties right now. And so you're right about the, about lack of education uh, is not going to be helpful uh, in, a, in a difficult economy to try to find employment. So uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, that story, Loser. Uh, Naftali, maybe you could share some of your uh experiences with us? Sure. Um, so I was basically on my own at the age of 21. Um, I had no education, no income, and no skills. So for a while, I lived in, in a dorm with other young adults who actually came to the U.S. for like an English language immersion program. And I, the American in the building, um, was the one with the least knowledge. Um, no knowledge about the world in general, but also no knowledge of American culture and history, even compared to those um, immigrants or, or, you know, students who came here for that program. Uh, I was on the job market for a while. Um, and, and let me just pause and say, um, I, I didn't have the concept of a resume or, or like going through the job application process. There was no preparation for that sort of thing in yeshiva. So I, I came in, you know, completely um, in addition to not having the skills, I also didn't know how to go about, you know, seeking a job. Um, you know, it's not like people around me growing up didn't have jobs, but us, you know, students, children in, in the schools were never kind of, you know, prepared for that. So um, every day I would look through the classifieds of various um, newspapers and, and I, I didn't feel like I had even just enough English skills, uh, let alone any other advanced skills for any decent job. I, of course, tried to apply for a job at B&H, the, the photo store that employs a lot of Hasidim, um, but I did not get even the entry-level job I was after. Um, after a while, I was caught up in one of these MLM schemes, the multi-level, whatever you call it, um, schemes, and it was some sort of insurance company. And, you know, it's not like an entirely fake um, job or, or business, but, you know, they require you to spend your money 
to set up sort of like a, a shop in, within their business. And so here I was unemployed and without any real prospects. And instead of earning money, I was actually spending money to one, one day, maybe I'll, I'll be able to, you know, um, make a small percentage off my sales. Um, so, so out of desperation, there was one time I even um, kind of like offered myself to participate in some sort of like lab experiment that I didn't understand the concept really what it was, but I do know it involved some sort of injections. And I had no clue. I was like, you know, it's done. The university is probably safe and they pay money. And as long as they would offer that, I would have um, some sort of income. It was, it, it, I was lucky that the woman at the desk um, was basically, she, she realized that I had no clue what I'm, <laughs> what I'm subjecting myself to. And she basically um, sent me to <laughs> go away. Um, I was working with an agency at the time to help me find employment. Um, I remember they wanted to help me um, be, get a job as a security person in a building in Manhattan. There was this firm that offered to train you for free and then employ you, find you a, a, a placement and employ you. You would get decently paid, $16 an hour, if I remember correctly. But the notion at the time that I a scrawny little guy who, let me remind you, didn't take any gym or sports as a child either, um, was going to protect the building of Manhattan. Uh, you know, Manhattan is not something we, we had visited as children. It was like taboo, right? So the only thing I knew it was that it's so terrible, it's disgusting, like in terms of like um, spirituality, spiritually, and, and, and then I knew about 9-11, but that's the extent of it. And I'm like, I'm, I'm going to protect a, a building in Manhattan. So I turned on that job, and, and ultimately I accepted a job working in a warehouse in Newark, New Jersey, um, basically where I was schlepping um, boxes all day long. Um, and shipping them out. It was, it was a very depressing realization that I, you know, I was the top of my class in Judaic studies. I, I, I'm a smart kid, you know, or I was a smart guy. I could have done so much. I had hopes and dreams to, to pursue a degree. I wanted to become a, a PhD in psychology. And here I am shopping boxes, you know, all day long, um, you know, in a dangerous neighborhood, um, doing the most meaningless thing. I mean, not to put down anyone who has to work in a warehouse, but it was just something that the cognitive dissonance between what I felt I was able to do versus what I was stuck doing was, was really painful. Um, so that's kind of like sort of a, a little bit of a snapshot of my own struggles um, after leaving Yeshiva. Right. Well, yeah. well thank you so much for, for sharing uh, those experiences with us, Naftali. And maybe, you know, Molly, uh, maybe we could follow up. One of the things that uh, Naftali mentioned was about he had no resume, no ability to write uh, a resume and what to put on a resume. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about some of those challenges to financial security and independence that your clients uh, face on a daily basis that you see in your practice. Right. So in terms of there are many, <laughs> but the main ones that I, you know, just to name a few, and I'm sure we'll dive deeper in as we go along in the conversation, but one of them is just basic lack of English reading skills and writing skills that me and you could take that for granted as far as filling out an application at McDonald's, but when you can't read what it is that you're trying to fill out, that automatically discourages you, even if you don't have a resume, because there are jobs out there, well, yeah, you can walk in there, you don't need a resume, and you can get that job. But you still have to fill out some kind of paperwork. And in looking at something and you have no idea what you're reading, right. it's already frustrating. And there's a certain element of shame that has been shared with me about that. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. um, knowing what a resume is, period, <laughs> is, is something relatively new because it, um, from my understanding and what's been shared with me from the clients is that um, in, in the, within the community, resumes and all the formalities that come along with applying for a job in the secular world don't necessarily apply within, just facts. They don't have to do all of that. It's less work. Um, but then when you find yourself in a place where you can't find an opportunity within the community, you need to come outside, you find yourself ill-equipped. You don't know what a resume is. You don't know where to search for it, how to search for it, what to say when they ask you just the first question. So tell me about yourself. That question alone 
They're like, well, what do you want to know? I don't even know what to tell you. Um, so that's part of it. Um, and then of course, other things that kind of come along is like work experience. Like some, some of the clients that I've had have had experience within uh, the community doing schlepper jobs, like Neftali uh, had mentioned, um, or maybe other more advanced um, types of roles, but some of those roles don't necessarily translate into the secular world. And then having to put that on a piece of paper to show it to somebody, hoping that they understand, like, unless they know about Jewish culture and the Jewish religion and customs and traditions and philosophy, some of those things on that paper is not gonna make much sense to them. Right. Um, and if you don't have a proper translator, someone to translate all of that experience into the secular world somehow, you know, you might as well be handing them nothing. Right. Right. Just, just to add, to add to that, yeah. I mean, there is, there is a, in the Hasidic community, like when I, when I, when I was, before I left, um, if you wanted a job, you ask someone, you, you, you basically make it known that you are looking for a job, mm -hmm. um, you know, and your father will happen to meet someone at Shacharis and tell him, oh, by the way, you got something for my son. And then, and, and then you just get a job. Um, and you call there, that networking. Yeah. Well, yes, we call it networking, you know, <laughs> um, but you know, back then we call it Shachas Min Chamarev, you know, uh, <laughs> and you just, you, you get a job. The idea of a resume and presenting yourself, it, it just, it doesn't, it just doesn't exist. So the, the whole concept is completely foreign to us. Right. Um, that's the first thing. And the second thing is like the thing about, about manual labor uh, um, and, and uh, schlepping work, as we call it, you know, Rodriguez, uh, the great singer, um, um, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, you know, there's no shame in hard work. There's no shame in being poor uh, and all that. The issue with that is that, um, that, you know, we live in a country where there's so much opportunity and somehow we have to, uh, uh, you know, apologize to ourselves for still doing the work that our grandfathers did in, in you know, in, in 18th century Poland. It's like, well, work is work. Well, yes, work is work, and we're all happy to have work and to put food on the table, but we live in a country with such immense opportunity, or at least used to be, and, and, and here we are, like, basically you know, very talented people, people who can be so much more doing, you know, menial work you know is it menial or mani i can never pronounce that word menial. I, well yeah. you know just to, to comment on that right uh, that's those are excellent points loser uh and naftali was talking about it's the dissonance right between what people who don't have these barriers right are capable of doing there's nothing wrong i, I will uh, agree with you on that there's nothing wrong with being a schlepper right we've all schlepped at one point or another and done jobs uh and uh and work is work right uh but if you are capable, and of course, when we talk about illiteracy, these are not people who are illiterate. In fact, they are extremely literate, but just right. not in, uh, with English language skills, just not, uh, and they're studied, uh, as Naftali said, right, and, and Loser as well, you were spending many years studying in the base medrash and, uh, and very aware, very, you know, uh, most folks have a tremendous amount of knowledge and scholarship about the religious subjects, but you're in, uh, you have this barrier once, and, and by the way, that networking system also works very well within the system itself, but you know, when you need to get beyond that, that's when these barriers are there, right? Lots I mean, of anxiety. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I got my first apartment through a network, you know, of that way. Oh, you know something? My son wants to move to the city. You know, maybe you know of something. I mean, networking is fantastic, and the Jewish community has used it from the very beginnings, right, uh, in America to get started and get moving. But uh, this, uh, on a larger scale, right, that can only go so far. And once you need, uh, once that network is failing individuals and they need to go outside, then they are limited, right? That dissonance between what they may be capable of doing and what their educational barriers are stopping them from achieving, right? Right, so, and just adding may... to that though, yes. just adding to that, um, there, there are some individuals that have acquired, like have done jobs that are transferable in the secular world, but what's the problem? There was never really any value placed on academic credentials 
So they could be applying, they could apply, let's say to a controller job. They've done that within the community. But when, let's say they don't find that opportunity there and they have to come outside, they'll look at this resume and say, like, oh, you have this experience, but there's no college degree at the bottom. Not even something to say high school diploma obtained. Some companies may give you leniency on that, but it's very rare. And in order for you to do that, you would have to go back to school. But what happens with that? In order for you to even access secular college university education, you need to have a high school equivalency. And what does that mean? English, math, sciences, social studies. You have to pass the task exam. So even before they reach that, they have to take a placement test and that by itself is a nightmare if you don't have the proper tools to get there. Absolutely, Amali. You know, uh, my father for many years ran uh, an alternative high school in Brooklyn uh, for students, right? In New York uh, State, you have till age 21 to pursue your education. And for a variety of reasons, people who had hit, you know, very difficult times in their lives, if they had to drop out of high school, they could come back and get their high school equivalency degree with my father uh, in Brooklyn, uh, in Bushwick, actually. And uh, he ended up catering to a large number of, uh, of yeshiva graduates and people who, did, who were trying desperately to pursue their education, didn't have those skills and needed to start basically at ground zero to take their high school equivalency exams. And so, you know, it, what we're saying is that, you know, if they had these skills all along, right, it would give them so many more options to pursue uh, and so much more success within uh, America itself. So I, I agree wholeheartedly in your, in your comments there, Yomali. Um, let's turn to, back to, to Loser here and then maybe Naftali about how you were able to perhaps, or what have you done to be able to overcome some of these challenges that you have uh, been faced with through these educational deficiencies? Um, well, I got lucky, <laughs> to be honest, uh, a couple of times. I had a couple of uh, uh, things of uh, luck. Um, first, I mean, now, obviously, you know, it's a long time has passed and I figured out how to um, uh, structure my life in a way where I can pursue uh, what I love and make a living. Um, as you can see, you know, I, uh, this is my... Uh, this is my casa, and it has wheels, and uh, and I'm currently uh, in the middle of nowhere in Wyoming, I think. Um, so this is now, but uh, in the beginning, it's it's an interesting story. Like I, I, I you know, many like right after I left, I was at a fundraiser, and uh, I met a uh, and I met a, a very wealthy um, guy named by the name of Steve Eisman, who was. Uh, um, who's uh, um, just a, a big uh, Jewish donor. And uh, we, we struck up a conversation and he told me, he's like, you know, you're a smart guy, you're a talented guy. Um, if you, you know, if you want, I'll give you a job at my hedge fund. And this was like 11 years ago. And, uh, and I said, you know, I'm afraid that if I take the job at your hedge fund, I will forget why, what I was pursuing, that I wanted to be an actor. I'm afraid I'm gonna make so much money that I'll forget that I wanna be an actor so I'm not going to take the job. Uh, and he respected that. And uh, then a couple of years later, I had uh, Felix Amir come out, this film. And that year, it was, it was a candidate's entry for the foreign language Oscar. So like, I, we, I almost went to the Oscars. So I, I saw him again at another fundraiser. And I went up to him and I said, um, by the way, Steve, you remember that time when you told me and uh, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, oh, yeah. I was like, guess what? This year, I almost went to the Oscars. And he looked me straight in the eye and said, like, yeah, but guess what? We did. Because they made a movie about his life, The Big Short, and it did win an Oscar. Blah, blah. Anyway, but I, ha I, had, I had several uh, um, things like that where people offered me jobs. They liked me and they thought I was smart and they thought I'm capable and they offered me a job, which is how I ended up working for Duncan Quinn for like uh, five years in fashion. And, uh, and I did very well in that industry. Even though when I walked in the door the first day, I knew zero about fashion. I not, not only didn't know anything about fashion, I, I, let alone about high fashion, what he was selling, but I also, I didn't really know how to like interact with the kind of people who buy that kind of uh, five, six thousand dollar suits. Um, but uh, in, in general, I would say that it was, it was luck. You know, I got lucky with Duncan Quinn. I got lucky with certain acting roles that, you know, that, that helped me survive. Um, and uh, to this day, even like if I have a dry spell with work, I would still 
uh, get in my car and do Uber or Postmates or DoorDash. Um, you know, I have no shame in that. And, and, uh, and I do what I have to do. But uh, there's no question that if I had, that, that if I had uh, uh, a better education, I mean, I did work at BNH as well. Even after I left, I worked at BNH. and um, But yeah, if I, if I had a better education, you know, if, even if I felt like, I, like, this, like this stuff is for me, I, to this day, I'm like, I, I would open it. I, I read a lot, but like, not like textbooks or anything like that. And I'm like, uh, what is this stuff? Like, uh, why, why do I need to start here? I already know one plus one. I already know like this stuff. Like, why don't you just tell me what I need to know? You know, like I'm 35 years old. I don't, I don't have time to sit down in a class and like, and, and now like, all right, start from the beginning. Right. No, just tell me what I need to know, you know, in a way, like, it, I guess in that way, I remain Hasidic, you know, I'm like. <laughs> and by the way, let's, let's, uh, for those uh, listeners out there who have not uh, seen Loser in, uh, in One of Us or in Felix and Me, you're, uh, wonderful films uh, and, uh, and fantastic uh, roles for you. And, and thank you for all of your work in, you. in that regard, Loser. So, um, no, if Tully, maybe you could tell us a little bit about some of the ways in which you have uh, tried to overcome uh, some of these educational uh, deficiencies. Um, sure. So um, I worked in a warehouse um, for four plus years and um, I was earning, you know, close to minimum wage. Um, you know, it was, you know, loser mentioned, you know, there's no shame and, uh, you know, these are great jobs. Um, you know, I w there was no shame. I mean, I guess not too much shame. There was that dissonance that I mentioned before. But, um, and in some ways, I, I miss it. You know, it was the job that required me to move around and do exercise. The last few years, um, you know, the job that I have is basically sitting in an office and sitting in meetings and all of that stuff. There's an element, of course, that I, you know, that I miss about it. But that being said, it, without a doubt, it is a low paying, it was a low paying job and low stimulation intellectual stimulation and that was just very very painful to me but during that time I was going to school evenings and weekends I was hoping to pursue a degree in psychology now I can go in separately and talking about <clears throat> talking about my struggle to get into college which was tremendous but ultimately I managed to get in and um, I was doing well I was very dedicated but it was a part-time thing so it dragged out for a while <clears throat> um, when I finished with my BA in uh, psychology uh, I, I had wanted to pursue a PhD in psychology or a PsyD, um, but that would require for me to go to uh, do a, a GRE exam and to do well, right, to, in order to get into any half-decent school. And again, this is where earlier knowledge comes into play. It's one thing, you asked me about psychology, I just finished studying it, I was doing well, that's one thing, but it requires, um, it, 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 it requires existing knowledge and it also has an element of time. You see, some of us, we, we are able to learn and we're able to articulate ourselves so, in, to some extent, but when you're put on the spot and you gotta respond about something you know, that, that is not in your first language and you only learned it you know, very late in the game and things like that, you, you don't, you're not able to kind of like go in there and you know, pluck it out and remember it and use it. Um, so, so to this day, look, I settled. Uh, I went to get a master's in social work. I mean, again, I'm proud of that accomplishment and, um, and I did well, but the fact is people don't realize and they often say, look, you've, su you've succeeded, you've done well for yourself. But again, when you compare it to my capabilities, um, I've come up short again and again. And to this day, I I'm already, you know, I'm 34, I've been out in the world, so to speak, for 14 years almost or 13 years. And, and to, to this day, I come upon so many different um, obstacles and things that it is expected that I would know, and I simply don't know. You know what I mean? So most of the times you're able to kind of like smile along, nod along, and be like, oh, yeah, 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 sure. And then it like totally goes over your head, but the other person doesn't realize it. But there are occasions where you're just stumped. It's something you actually need to know in order to continue this meeting or continue, you know, a conversation. And, and you know, and this is for me, which is like, you know, I'm in the kind of social science world and, and advocacy. But imagine if someone who's in a very technical um, environment, uh, you can't just kind of nod along and, and let something seriously, you know, fail. Um, so it's, it's a struggle even for people who, so to speak, you know, are fitting in and they've managed to pick up the English language and, and so forth. Um, for many people, I'm sure Yamali can speak a lot more to it uh, more broadly, but I think a lot of the struggles uh, persist. And I've, I've encountered this in my work 
when I speak to people who, again, on the surface, they're like, oh, they've made it, they've succeeded, and they tell me how much um, it's, it's a constant struggle. Yeah, th thank you for that, Naftali. Yeah, you know, Molly, um, you know, in this, within this structure that we're talking about, there are differences, right, between the uh, secular subjects that are taught to uh, men and women, right? Uh, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the differences there. Um, and of course, we're talking about how many of these uh, educational, uh, lack of secular education has affected, let's say, male graduates of, uh, of many different uh, yeshivot. But what about uh, women, which are often given, uh, particularly in Israel and elsewhere, they are uh, given more options to more education. Are they uh, in a better position to, to get jobs in the outside world? I have to say, in my experience, versus uh, the males, the women have definitely stepped up their game in terms of education because they realize they're, some of them are the breadwinners of their house. So they don't, they, yes, they can beat themselves up psychologically like, oh, I should have been here. I should have known this. If I only just, you know, if it was earlier, if I was younger, because a lot of them are mothers and, you know, they don't have time to beat up on themselves. They just what do I need to do? Where do I need to go so I can make this money? <laughs> that is the mentality. And so what they've done is like they've had the gumption to go out and get the education, even if they didn't learn it before. But they will find a way um, to get the tools that they need in order to excel in the careers that they choose because they are the breadwinners of the house. They have to. And not for everyone, but for the majority of the clients that I've seen, yeah, I would have to say overwhelmingly so. Now, the biggest issue, though, is being able, to, especially now, um, is the childcare issue. It's definitely hit them a lot harder than most um, because it's like you have to work, but you also have to find childcare um, for your children and make sure that, you know, they're receiving the education that they need. Um, and that's been a really big challenge, especially if you have to work from home and also be overseeing uh, the children if they don't go to a yeshiva, say, per se. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, these, uh, many of these differences, I would just say, you know, my own background, having been raised Orthodox, but in a Jewish day school, which did have secular subjects taught, um, you know, I think what, what we're, there, there's so many different opportunities that you have, right? And what we're hearing is that it's not impossible to catch up if that is your, your main focus and you don't have all of these other uh, responsibilities, whether it's child care or other responsibilities, which of course most people do have, which makes it that much harder to catch up. But if you are educated in both, you know, uh, you know, Limude Kodesh and uh, in Limude Chol, right, and the secular subjects and the outside world, it, you know, then you have opportunities if, if and when you need them, right? And for, and as we know, there are many people for, who do need to go outside the community to earn a living, right? Uh, and so we know that that uh, process, that dual curriculum process works so well for so many people who are living what would be considered under any uh, st standards, you know, Torah, Judaism, right, and a Torah lifestyle, and yet don't have to overcome all of those, uh, those same shortcomings in the secular world. Um, it's just, and I think that's really what we're hearing here, right? Not that, uh, that, you know, that this is just an awful lot to add. It's hard enough to make it right in America in any way or anywhere for that matter. And now you're starting out at a major disadvantage when, in fact, you need to go outside. And, and this is not just for people who have left the community in its entirety, but for those who are within the community but need to earn a living outside of it. So um, this is not about leaving. It's about just, uh, just having opportunities uh, to support families and yourself and having that sense of, uh, of independence. Right? I see, Loser, you, you want to, oh, yeah. Yes. I was gonna. I, I was gonna say that it's not that it's not just uh, uh, that. I, mean, I have I have uh, uh, two brothers who work in uh, in uh, in IT, and uh, and they you know they're self taught, and uh, my brother is like he works on Splunk. I mean I think there are probably gonna be like one person in the entire audience who knows what this is, uh, what the technology is. 
but it's a very it's a it's a very specific uh, um, uh, um, uh, specific technology networking that he's uh, that he's very good at, and he and he, and he keeps being asked by larger companies to join, and he's at B and H. What my, the point I'm trying to make is that is that even even if it's not necessarily academic, you know, even if it's just so people can put food on the table, so people can learn, and and even even people maybe now. Uh, it's a little bit more common than it was when I when I left, and I think it is. But when I left, like even that was considered like, oh, what's that family is weird. That, you know, their father works like if if he wasn't working for a Jewish company, you'd be like, oh, that father works for some Goyish company with computers. Um, it's kind of weird. Um, and and I think that that's another element of it. Uh, and when it comes to 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 work and education, is like. If you're gonna if you're gonna take away people's computers, you're gonna take away people's internet, you're gonna take away people's education, you're gonna take away, you're basically not gonna give them any of the tools at all that they could possibly use to survive. Then all you're leaving them is with schlepping jobs. And the real issue with schlepping jobs isn't the dignity, which you know there's no loss of that. It's really the upward mobility of it, you know. It's it's the it's the it's the income of it. Like even now, even if even if you're working for fifteen or even twenty dollars an hour, if you got eight children, you know, and you have the hey you know you have the yeah and you have the holidays coming up now, you know, there's like there's no way, let alone having to you know to marry off a child, there's no way you can survive on that money. Right, right. You know, um, hearing all, all your comments, you know, begs the question, though, how much of uh, within the communities themselves, how much is this lack of access to the outside world? How much of that do you think is built into the system purposefully, right, in order to keep people in the system uh, as a po and then just put people into certain jobs that are acceptable uh, and others that are not. Uh, maybe, uh, Naftali, do you want to address that one? To start We're going to go 100%, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll, we'll get back to you, loser, on that for sure. And you know, Molly as well. You know, <clears throat> I, I'm often asked this question, and, and most people outside the ultra-Orthodox community kind of come down with on that side, basically thinking, look, this is, the leadership is doing this intentionally. Um, I don't know if I agree fully. Um, I do know that, yes, they don't want people to go to college. Yes, they prefer if people don't work outside in the world. Of course, if you do break out and you're successful, they're going to use you as proof that you can make it on the outside. That's definitely going to happen. Um, but, but generally speaking, they, they discourage it and they don't make it easy. I, I just disagree, not, not that you've said that this is definitively the reason, but, but with those who say that they're intentionally um, trying to kind of like handicap people so that they're stuck within the community, I don't know if I agree. I think they just put the value of Judaic studies at such an extreme top priority that it's like it doesn't even leave room for secular studies. It's like, well, well, you know, look, we have to train every single boy to become a rabbi. It's kind of like, you know, we don't want them to regret it that later in life that you, you didn't train them to be a rabbi. It's kind of like the, the reverse of what we're saying, right? To them, it's like almost like, oh my God, they're going to come back and say, how dare you deprive me of an opportunity to become a rabbi because you spent so much time on, you know, profane um, English and science, right? right? So, so they just feel like, What's most important, both for your future as a Jewish leader, as a rabbi, as well as um, in heaven, you know, when you come up in heaven after, you know, passing away, um, is, is that you will have all this Torah study. The, the, the lack of education and, the, and the, all the consequences that come with it, in my opinion, are more uh, a byproduct. Now, there are plenty of rabbis who, who will admit to you that that's a, a, an added bonus. <laughs> that you come out there, you're stuck, and you're like, it prevents you from leaving the community and things like that. Of course, they ignore the obvious, um, the obvious dynamic where many people actually leave the community because they didn't get an education, right? They feel betrayed and, and um, so offended um, when they realize their limited opportunities. And they're like, okay, where can I go and get an education? And inevitably, it leads them outside of the community. But, but I'm just saying that's, you know, generally speaking, if I have to say, you know, what's the bigger reason for why they're not providing these tools, it has more to do with just valuing Judaic studies to such an extreme, totally ignoring, for instance, Maimonides, the Rambam, who understood that you need a healthy balance, and plenty of other Jewish leaders um, who understood that, that you need that healthy balance, kind of like what you said before. There are plenty of yeshivas that manage to do so and understand it. 
and, and believe it or not, they all grow up Talmidei um, Chachamim, right? Learned people in, the, in Judaic studies, yet also able to support themselves. I have plenty of um, relatives from my wife's side who are um, from the Litvish community, lawyers, <laughs> you know, very common. Um, and, and of course, unfortunately, it's deteriorating over there, the next generation of the Litvish kids. So that's the ultra-Orthodox, but not Hasidic, to the viewers who don't know. Um, unfortunately, we're seeing a decline in the secular education, and then kind of a shift to more dependence on government assistance, lower, quality, lower jobs. And, and one thing that hasn't yet come up is uh, higher rates of fraud, you know, which inevitably, when you deprive people of an opportunity, but you throw them into a world where they need to earn a, a decent living, right? Like Loser mentioned, multiple kids. Um, it, it's common sense that people are going to have to kind of do what they got to do to survive and to support their families. And, and I'm not the one making that up. The Talmud says, uh, uh, right? A father must teach us on a trade. And if he doesn't, it's as though he teaches him to steal. And it's common sense, right? You know, you're going to put someone out there with zero opportunity, but with a lot of responsibility. Um, they feel that obligation to do what they can do to make some money. Uh, yes, ab absolutely. Thank you for, for responding to those questions. We've been getting questions uh, from our audience, uh, and I'd like to pose those to some of our uh, panelists here. Um, so um, let's see. Um, you know, one question here is for Yomali here. Can you give us um, some uh, specific uh, gut-wrenching or, or shocking stories without, of course, uh, naming any clients, but that would help uh, perhaps elucidate some of the issues, these very uh, real challenges that people are facing as a result of their limited uh, secular educational background? I think, well, there are a few. But if there is one person that does come to mind, there's this general, at least from what's been shared, there's this general consensus, if you leave, you will fail. And so I think it, the first time I had the conversation with this person, the question that I asked them was, listen, fine, you can tell me all the traumas that you've been having, but what do you want? Because you have options, you have a choice in terms of what you want to do with your life. So what do you want to do? And in asking that question alone broke that person because they're like, first of all, they're comparing their, themselves to everybody else and saying, you know, at this age, I'm supposed to be doing this. I'm supposed to have this amount of money. I'm supposed to... I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to. I've been told, I've been told, I've been told. This is the way it's supposed to be. No one in my life has ever asked me what I wanted to do. And it, I felt that it was my responsibility to show them, well, let me show you. I'm not saying this is going to be easy. I'm not going to focus on the doors that are closed for you. Let's focus on the doors that are open. And I showed them. And we were working together, trying to get them to apply to jobs. This person didn't even know how to use a computer. We started doing a little bit of that work, right? Um, but when it came time to actually go on an interview, like after we fixed, we took out all their skills, presented it in a way that's digestible. We practiced and practiced and practiced. When they got to the door, when they got to the table, they completely panicked. And they just turned right around and left. And they couldn't even explain themselves. Um, there, was, there was anxiety, imposter syndrome. There was so much going on in that person's mind. And before they even got to sit down and talk to anybody, they already convinced themselves that they cannot do it. Yeah. And then they decided not to, not to look for a job in the secular world, to just stay in the community because it's easier. Um, 
but to this day, I mean, I haven't been in touch with them recently, but to my knowledge, they're still working in that dead end job because they just don't feel like they would, they themselves are their own stopper. No one is telling them. They themselves have convinced themselves that they cannot succeed mm -hmm. unless they succeed the way they've been taught to. Right. I think that is probably one of the saddest things I have had to witness in terms of working with my clients now. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that, that very moving story, Omali. And, you know, you're, you're there seeing these, uh, you know, trying to help people overcome many of these, uh, these issues that we're discussing here. And uh, it's such important work that you're doing. And thank you for sharing that with us. Um, you know, one of the things that while you're speaking really uh, brought up for, for, for me is the notion, of course, that, you know, we're talking about these basic skills, but we are now in an economy, right, which requires so much more even than basic skills, right? To get a higher earning job, you need to have specialized knowledge and specialized skills and higher education. I know part one of this series dealt with higher education more specifically, uh, but of course that is something here that is so important. You're talking about people who are, who have the ability, right, to, to accomplish so much in a professional setting and they're handicapped because they don't have the basic skills and there is a tremendous divide. And I think this is what both Loser and Naftali were hinting at earlier because actually you're spending so much time studying, right, and understanding about ancient text and doing scholarship uh, and doing all of these things that should in fact set you up for success uh, if you had the linguistic skills and the other skills in math and science and things of that nature. And yet uh, you're extremely limited with them only within this one way, uh, within the community, right? Within a spiritual uh, or holy text and studying of that. So I think there's this, uh, there's this sort of real uh, split here, right? Uh, that both uh, Naftali and Luzer are, are referencing here. Uh, do you guys want to want to follow up on that? Any? Oh, me, me or Naftali? Sure. Naftali, go ahead. Loser, I'll, I could let you go first. Oh, no, no, it's fine. Go ahead. Well, I actually, you know, I've heard um, the two of you mentioned before that these are not, I mean, these are highly literate um, individuals. And I think to some extent it's true, but, but depending on what you mean by literate. Um, I could be literate in playing video games all day. I can know every video game in the world. Um, I'll be literate in that sense, but I won't have any literacy that is transferable to the real world or, or to anything beyond video game, gaming, right? Um, you know, for instance, I had this, this very interesting experience that I think can capture, you know, this issue, how things that you learn in Judaic studies, they're so limited to Judaic studies that it doesn't really transfer to the real world. So um, I was 21 years old and I was sitting at a Shabbos table with less like non-Hasidic um, ultra-Orthodox people. So people who've gotten a better education, they spoke English. And it came up at that Shabbos meal that I did not know which direction is north, south, west and east, right? The directions. And they taught me on the spot, right? W-E spells we and that's, you know, whatever. And, and okay, so I learned that. And in my mind for the next six years, I always assumed that north, equals Mizrach. Mizrach is, is, is Mizrach Tafen, Darim, Marav is the, the Hebrew version of the directions. And I always thought Mizrach is north based on what I just learned. You tell me that north is up, right? Then Mizrach, which is where we've always learned, is up. The Beis HaMikdash, the, the temple was there. God is a Mizrach. When you pray, you got to face Mizrach. And it was always like the assumption that that's where Mizrach is. That's, it's north. Fast forward six years, I'm in graduate school, I kid you not. Um, um, my professor's name is Dr. Mizrahi or Professor Mizrahi. And she wanted to break the ice and she goes, um, you know, when you hear the name Mizrahi, what comes to mind? And the, the whole class is quiet. Nobody raises their hands. It's a bunch of like, I don't know, dorky social work students, okay? So, so finally, I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to be brave. <laughs> All right. Loser, calm down. <laughs> Anyway, I, I raise my arm and, and I say, um, it means north. And this professor looks at me, gives me the most bizarre look, and she goes, what? No, no, it, it means east, but that's not my point. Um, what I, where I was going with this was to see if anyone has heard of the fashionist, fashionist, fashion guy, whatever, Isaac Mizrahi. 
it was so humiliating and it was just, uh, I mean, it's fine. I get over these things a lot. And, and I had a lot of these in, in school, but, but the point is, you know, you would think that something that we've learned so much about, right? Where's the base of Mikdash? Which direction did they put X, Y, or Z? You would think directions is the one thing we would know. And the reality is at the age of 21, I, when I would hear the radio talking about inbound uh, traffic going inbound and outbound, that, that I had no clue what that was. And then when I finally learned that, and I still didn't know how it, me, you know, how it relates to the Hebrew version of it. So my point is that, that most of what we learn in the Judaic studies is not transferable. And, and it's an important point because yeshiva leaders have been recently, recently trying to make the argument that, look, our education is different but it's similar, right? Substantially equivalent, right? So we may not learn a, a, a course on math, on tr tr trigonometry. I don't even know what that is, but, but right? We don't, we don't do courses on these, but it comes up, it comes up in various places in the Talmud and you just pick it up, but you don't. That's the point. You don't, and it's not transferable. Right. Well, your story, Naftali, uh, you know, about not knowing which direction Mizrach is, I mean, of course, this, this is challenging uh, geographically, but also in terms of Jewish knowledge, it would suggest that you never were exposed to the poetry of Yehuda Halevi, let's say, right? Um, and there's so much of, you know, that secular knowledge could help illuminate within uh, Jewish texts and Jewish literature throughout the ages here. And so, you know, I have to say that, you know, my own background, having gotten uh, an excellent education, both in terms of religious subjects and secular subjects, they enhanced one another throughout. Uh, I can't say it was always that case, but overall, and it really inspired me to want to go into a field like Jewish studies, right, and Jewish literature, to think about how we could combine the beauty of both of those traditions together in a way. Um, and so I think that's really one of the things that, that we're arguing for here, right, and thinking about. And you mentioned about uh, some of those Board of Education requirements. Uh, I think we have a question about that, but I didn't want to cut off Loser. I know who had something to, to add to this discussion right now. So. No, not much. It's, it's just that... To me, like the big, uh, um, uh, the the big the big issue is, here is 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 an incredible amount of brain drain in that community. Mm -hmm. You have people who are capable of contributing so much to themselves and to the world, and 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 they're stuck um, doing, you know, jobs that are that are that are that are just not equivalent to the to the to the level of skill that they really are have because like. You know, like Yamali was telling the story, this incredibly heartbreaking story. It's like, it's, it's, it's terrible that someone who clearly has ambitions and has goals and has, and wants to do things in life is like, you know what? It's too difficult. I can't do it. You know, I'm too far behind. Um, and that's one, and that's, that's a, one thing is, is the, the amount of brain drain. And I they were so close though. That's the hard right. part. You're like, right, right here. And they're not the only ones, and they're not the only ones. Um, and the other thing is, like someone mentioned in the, in, 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 uh, in, I don't know if it was in the chat, or like you mentioned it just now about Jewish studies uh, and about the going to college for Jewish studies. And, uh, and uh, Naftuli was talking about our education that we had. We get a terrible Jewish education too, by the way. You know, we got a horrible Jewish education, okay? There are Goyim who know Tanakh better than us. I'm talking about evangelical Christians who actually truly study Tanakh. They truly study the Old Testament. They actually know Jewish history. Our Jewish history literally begins and ends at the Baal Shem Tov, more or less. Like we can, like we can tell you a lot of great anecdotal stories and, and, and moral um, uh, stories about things that happened in the last three, 400 years. But when it comes to like, when exactly did Rashi live and when, did, when, did, when was the Talmud written and any of that, we know nothing. We were never taught that stuff. You know, we were, it, and that is, is also a huge shame. We're not, only, we're, not, we're not only not equipped to, we're not only not well educated in the secular world, we're, we're not educated in the Jewish world, you know, and, 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 and we are given that information with such a high level of confidence. And to me, one of the biggest uh, um, disappointments that I had uh, after I left was meeting uh, other Jews who have studied Jewish history, who did, who do have knowledge of, of Jewish studies. And, and I come at them with like such confidence about halacha and about the rules and how we are doing it right. And they're like rolling their eyes and like, dude, you know, you have 
no idea what you're talking about. You, you, you sound like Trump on hydroxychloroquine. You're like, what are you even talking about? You know nothing. You know, so I think that is a huge shame. And someone brought it up in the comments or in the chat about, you know, um, us get, getting Jewish study class. And I think it is important. I think if someone, if someone wants to become a Jewish professional, a professional, some, become professional in, Jewish, in Jewishness, you know, look at the Sasha Katz, you know, Rabbi Katz, sorry, Rabbi Katz. I mean, this is a guy who is, who, who studied in yeshiva and was a Dafiyomi Magachir and, and knows and, and probably thought he knew everything there is to know. And then the more he read and the more he got, he, he know, he, I, I, again, I don't know, I don't want to, I don't know if that's a story, but I, that, I'm just making an assumption of how it happened. He must have gone and like read more and were like, oh my God, like <laughs> Judaism is a lot more than that. So I think even that, you know, should be, should be improved. Right. Well, I mean, I think, Luzi, you raised the issue, of course, that there's great, uh, there's a great uh, variety, right, in terms of how even the, the uh, subjects, the spiritual or the Lumu de Kodesh are taught from one yeshiva to another, right? I think this goes to the heart of some of the work that Noftali is doing, right, to think about that. And so that particularly in regards to, of course, the secular subjects, some are doing a very fine job in teaching this and others it's almost non-existent. So a question from our audience, and this is uh, for Naftali, do you, uh, could you talk about why you think that some yeshivas are, uh, I mean, this, are, are uh, resisting of the calls for just these very basic requirements in their educational uh, curriculum? Well, it's, I think I, I actually addressed it earlier <clears throat> when I pointed out <clears throat> that it has more to do with the emphasis on Judaic studies than it has to do with shunning the secular studies. And, and again, I think there's an element of both, but to, you know, to them, it's like, to, to those individuals who resist it, it's like, no, 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 if, if, if we're increasing secular studies, we're automatically decreasing some, uh, sorry, if we're, in, yeah, if we're increasing secular studies, we're automatically decreasing Judaic studies, um, and, and how can we do that? You know, where it, so in other words, it's coming at the expense of the secular studies and and it just seems like something you know that you can't do but another thing that i did not mention is that the reason this is able to kind of like um get out of control and people who are otherwise sane reasonable people are like no 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 don't don't make any changes i think has a lot to do with the media in the ultra orthodox community it, we're not talking about and we think of doing a panel on that in the future but we're not this is not a media that invites different opinions right it's not even just a biased media where they'll at least have a token person with an opposing view or they'll give a quote to a person with an opposing view no here there's one opinion and then they refer to like us for instance as these rotten disgruntled crazy people you know what i mean who want to assimilate and cause a spiritual holocaust to the to the community so so even otherwise reasonable people you know when they don't have any exposure to the real discussions about this issue they get so frightened off about this notion of, of making improvements to the education system that they don't want to hear about it and and that is part of the problem right um but of course there are so many different angles to this issue um that it's it's really insurmountable to some extent to try to you know fully address it um you know we're trying we have our own kind of um we have a newsletter that we often mail to uh, almost 20,000 Hasidic homes um, that kind of, you know, puts out our view of it and explains it from a Judaic perspective, why learning secular studies is important. But again, the majority of people, you know, as soon as we send out those newsletters, the, the community sends out robocalls and hangs up um, signs in the shul that everyone should rip it up, should not read it, and should make sure their kids can never reassemble it and retape it together because God's forbid anyone actually can entertain our perspective. So you have a few extremists um, who are kind of pushing this and, and preventing a discussion around this issue. And then you have even otherwise reasonable people kind of just going along because they, they're not even able to see what the positive side of improving education would look like. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, do you see, and, and this could open to all of our panelists here, um, do you see any positive changes in that regard that's coming from the incredible work of Yafed yeah, and Footsteps and individuals who are trying to affect change in the community to give people opportunities to fulfill uh, all of their great promise that they may have? Um, do you guys, see, I know what Naftali just said is very disheartening, but are there areas where things are changing and improving, or do you see this as just really uh, not changing right now, and we definitely 
uh, need to raise more awareness of this before uh, there will be any substantive change for these tens of thousands of students, right, that are that are going to be struggling. They may not be struggling right now, but they will be struggling, you know, uh, down the line. And, you know, just anecdotally, I know, for example, my mother, who uh, was for many years a, a reading uh, instructor and teacher in the New York City public school system, uh, she tutors a lot of kids from, uh, from these yeshivot, uh, who are incredibly smart and they could rattle off 30, 40 Mishnayos by heart, right, in, uh, in fourth, fifth grade, uh, but haven't yet uh, been taught, you know, the, the ABCs, right? Uh, but they're whizzes at their Lumide Kodesh, right? Uh, and they just, uh, and their parents want to make sure that they aren't going to be handicapped without an education, so they're getting them some tutoring, but it's not being done in the, in the schools, it's being done extracurricularly in this manner of tutoring and paying for it if they have the ability to do that separately. Um, so, I mean, there are people who are, of course, in that world who recognize this, but what are some of those positive things, because we're, we're getting towards the end of this, and you've all worked very hard, I know, to help raise awareness of this issue, and so are there any positives that we could look at and see and maybe try to build upon as we move forward to try to address these, uh, these many issues we've been discussing. Well, I'll, I mean, as far as, as positive uh, um, outcomes from that education system, I think it does, I don't know if it's the education system they have that, that, that's the positive side of it, but I think the, the cultural part of it, um, the thinking outside of the box I think the, the cre cre creative thinking, creative problem solving, I think that is definitely a product of that, of that environment uh, in, in many ways. And uh, you see a lot of times where like uh, um, from people, because, because they don't have the barriers of like professionalism and because they don't have an education, because they don't have an MBA, you know, they, they don't end up doing the thing that the MBA, you know, teaches you to do if you want to fix your business. They end up doing something completely outside of the box. Um, so I think that, that um, I mean, I don't know if you can call it an upside because you, you, have to get, you have to get that person to the point where they're running a business first. Um, but if you get to that point and someone is already lucky, I think that does, it, I think that is a, something that, the, that scrappiness uh, mm -hmm. And that creativity, cre creative problem solving. I think that I think that is probably the most uh, generous uh, um, I'll get. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you, loser. Um, you know, Molly, did you want to add? It's a couple of things, actually. Um, I have seen. It's interesting enough that um, there are some folks that, despite the challenge of knowing that they're going to have to take some time to get an education they still need money. So what I've seen is there's a buildup in resilience and perseverance. Not that that wasn't always the case. Very, very resilient and persistent folks. Um, but uh, I've seen more people thinking about, you know, being self-employed and what that looks like for them and just taking control. Okay, I can't get a job in the secular world can't find something in the community, well, you know, I'm just going to do my own thing. And these small business, these small self-employment start becoming little businesses and then they start growing. That's something that I actually find a positive in all of this chaos, <laughs> um, is that they will find a way to kind of just move forward regardless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a positive that I've seen happening in lieu of getting an education and all the loopholes that they have to jump through to become financially independent. Right. You know, and, and I'll tell you before we, we hear from you on this, I would just say that notion of resiliency within uh, the Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox world, I mean, this is uh, such an important thing to understand, right? And the, the history, right, which these communities have evolved from, right? Uh, most uh, in the Hasidic communities, especially many of these communities were founded as just the, the, the remnant that remained from the destruction of, uh, of the Horeban of the Holocaust in Europe. And one can begin to understand when you know that history, right, the insularity, the fear of the outside world, I think all of those things are so important in understanding this community and understanding perhaps the resistance 
to the secular world and the outside world. It makes perfect sense in many ways. I think what advocates uh, like Naftali and Yomali and, and Loser and so many others that are trying to, to have to, re to remove those impediments to success in the outside world are saying, so we certainly understand that, uh, and but, uh, and but, right? Uh, also, uh, this is important now, right? And so maybe it's time where we kind of test that water a little bit and see where we can go and not shut out opportunity to so many people. So uh, I think that, that was something that I was, was hearing, uh, Yomali, when you were talking about that resiliency, right, and that, idea of trying to make the, and, and trying to become a success. If one thing is blocked, you try something else, right? Uh, until you get to where you need to be. Right. And also just to, the other thing is, I think now in this day and age, you have a lot more options than just the college route, which is something that I also advocate for. Like, I just, I saw someone's comment in the chat, you know, maybe they need to just treat, um, you know, what's the, the, the Talmudic degree is maybe a liberal arts so that they can continue. And you know what? I've, I've, I have, I have advocated for that in the sense I'm like, okay, Turo accepts those credits. So why don't you start there? Right. Okay? Or, you know, you can, there's a dual, there is a dual program where you can do both your um, uh, high school, you can study, you could do the high school equivalency and be getting credits toward college. So that way you're not losing a year. Like there's more options. You can do things online if you can't physically sit in a classroom. Absolutely. There are more options than just you have to do it this way. Right. I think that's a positive of what's come around as well. Today. Thank, you. Thank you so much for sharing that, Imali. Uh, Tully? Yeah, I don't want to hold it up much longer, but I, I think your question was, um, you know, are we seeing a difference already um, given all these years of advocacy and you know absent um the pandemic of course which has really set a lot of people and organizations back for uh, some time um i think we had been seeing a lot of progress so first of all on the city and the state level the fact that they were investigating and kind of looking over the shoulders of the yeshivas um it forced many yeshivas to um even though much of it was a charade but it did force them to um ramp up their existing 90 minutes or so um, <clears throat> better training for teachers, better, more content, even just a little bit of science and social studies. Like one, one year we, we did a panel discussion or, or a round table discussion around MLK Day, Martin Luther King Day. And the notion that, that we brought together public schools and yeshiva, public school kids and yeshiva graduates to highlight that, that growing up in New York City, we never even knew about MLK Day um, or who, who it was and any of that. And um, it was an opportunity to learn. As soon as we began promoting it, Pearls, our opposition, suddenly puts up pictures of, of Hasidic kids reading about Martin Luther King in this, like, you can see that it's like a printout of a book um, stapled together. And, and, you know, so just having these discussions is pushing them in a certain direction where they have to um, take it a little more seriously. Parents are beginning to rumble, you know, if you're in some of these Hasidic WhatsApp groups, you could see people are, are, are you know, beginning to speak up a little bit more. And, and I think it's, it's applying a lot of pressure. Now, uh, on this policy level, of course, it's been stalled because of the pandemic. But um, I do hope that as soon as things go back to resembling a little bit of normalcy, that um, the state will once and for all pass these new regulations, which would basically outline a better enforcement mechanism of this century-old law and would um, usher in a whole new era where Yes, you can have both a full Jewish education alongside a full secular education. And we would see the results um, quite swiftly. You know, right now there's a lot of poverty in the ultra-Orthodox community. And again, this is not me saying it, it's the UJA study, um, community study of 2012. Um, and, and hopefully uh, this all would be impacted um, with a better education. Well, thank you so much for those comments, Naftali. Thank you, Loser. Uh, thank you, Yomali, for joining us. We've gotten dozens of questions on our chat, and unfortunately, we don't have time to answer all of them. We are at our 75-minute uh, limit here, but perhaps we could have a follow-up panel down the line uh, and answer some uh, of the many uh, very interesting questions and important topics that we weren't able to get to today. But I really want to thank our very distinguished panelists today uh, for joining us. And hopefully uh, you guys could go and check out part one of the series as well on the website. And, uh, and 
Take care, everyone. Thank you all for joining with us today. Thank you so, Thank you much. so much for having me. Thank you. Thanks, guys.